Thank you so much. When I'm truly successful, I'll be able to just say, uh, hi, I'm Willem Dafoe, <laughs> and that will cover everything. <laughs> but, but thank you, Grafton, for that, that gracious and uh, detailed uh, introduction. So I think, oh, there we are. 29 years, it's crazy, I think about this. 29 years ago, I was sitting, not literally where you are, this is a beautiful venue. Uh, it was in the gun building, I believe, in the auditorium there. But uh, in my own graduation seat, that's me in my 1989 glory. I couldn't find bigger glasses. I tried really hard, but <laughs> those were the largest, uh, largest I could get. Uh, my parents were, oops. I'm a tech guy, as you can tell. <laughs> Let's just go with this. There we go. This is my parents' terrified face. <laughs> they were very proud of me, it was a happy moment, but also they were filled with certain trepidations, you might say, uh, wondering what the future was going to bring. Many of you here may be wondering the same thing. Uh, the students, soon to be graduates, uh, parents, family, uh, friends. And I want to share a little bit of my own experience in terms of, of some things that I learned, uh, a principle that I learned and three sub-points that relate to that, which I think could bear uh, uh, on your own career as you go forward. And I specifically want to talk about the issue of what going forward means, because uh, the idea of forward requires some flexible thinking. So as Grafton mentioned, I was a painting major, and uh, samples of some of my work, uh, as Julian Stancic said, I was not a colorist. It was just like yellow, OK, that's good, works for me. Working in the constructivist uh, mode, uh, Ed Mishkowski was actually one of my instructors and uh, really kicked my butt many times about what I was doing, uh, especially when I got too whimsical, as I did in some of my sculptures. But I thought I was pretty hot stuff. I came out of school with a uh, traveling scholarship. That's me on the lower left, I believe. And I had won all of the awards that you could win at the school, and I thought, all right, you know, I'm cool. And then Mo Brooker got on stage. He was giving the commencement speech in 1989 and kind of brought us all to uh, uh, reality. And Mo congratulated everybody. Mo, of course, as many of you know, is, is a wonderful uh, artist uh, of the region and, and international renown. And Mo got up on stage and he said, uh, there were about 100 of us. It was about 100 of us in the graduating class. And Mo said, statistically, 1% of you will make your living as solely as an artist with a capital A, as a practicing studio artist, 1% of you. So, yeah, there you go. And <laughs> our parents were looking around like, now you tell us this information? <laughs> and each of us students, myself included, were sitting there going, yes, that's going to be me, <laughs> that person. Well, guess what? It wasn't me. I was not the person from our class who became the artist with a capital A. I became other things, as, as Grafton alluded to. And I became those things through a process that I didn't set out intentionally to pursue, but I realized in retrospect I made good use of, which is to think laterally. And this is the one thing, the takeaway, I could stop right now and just say, think laterally, thank you, goodbye, and uh, leave you with that. But I want to talk a little bit more about what that means and then give you three examples from my own career in terms of how that was applied. We often think of ourselves at any point in time as going forward. We want to go forward to our opportunities that are, are out there in front of us, to the, the job that we hope to get, to the next piece that we hope to do. And we think of this as a line, going from where we are to where we want to be, to our goal. But this idea of going forward or going upward or going onward is really an illusion. We have a sphere of opportunity a sphere of activity around us. And the best path of action may not necessarily be what's in front of us, but things that are off to the side of us. Or perhaps even something that's behind you. And again, I'm saying this figuratively as opposed to literally, but sometimes maybe indeed literally behind you. When I graduated from the institute, I came out with a degree in painting. And by going back to, and I, I, it sounds snobbish to say this, but I went to a, a uh, to a community college to study for Photoshop. And I was embarrassed, because I like, God, I'm a CIA traveling scholarship winner. What am I doing in a, in a community college? Horror of horrors. My mom taught there. And she was like, don't be such a snob, and, and uh, smacked me around and said, it's good for you. Um, and I learned Photoshop there, and that enabled me then to go forward to uh, Disney, uh, sorry, to Ohio State, where I studied computer graphics. They didn't have those courses at the time here at the Institute, even though now we have a fabulous animation program. At the time, that didn't exist. You know, we, patted our dinosaurs on the head and got into our rockmobiles and, and came to the studio. Um, but we were in the classic uh, uh, majors of painting, sculpture, et cetera. But 
that path from Ohio State then led me on to Disney. But that path may not lead you to the goal you think you want to go to, but something that's even better. Maybe there's a tangent that's near what you wanted to achieve, but slightly off to the side, and is more enriching and more rewarding than you could have imagined. So in terms of these three principles, I want to start with the first one, which is developing your talent stack. Anything you do, there are going to be people who are better than you at it and people who are worse. Uh, if you're a painter, you're an actor, what have you, a plumber. And where you really start to distinguish yourself is by combining certain abilities with other abilities and coming in with sort of like a Dagwood sandwich of skills that you can apply flexibly to different situations and that combination distinguishes you from other people uh, who may be in that same realm. So for me, being inspired by Luxo Jr., Pixar's animated short film, uh, this was kind of the kick in the pants to go back and learn things that I didn't know, like computer graphics, and even to learn computer graphics to back up further to programming, computer programming, and, and math. I mean, I was not a math guy in, in, in high school. I heard it was important, but it wasn't really of interest to me. But these were things that I needed to learn to add to my talent stack to go into computer graphics and then to uh, use that as a way to get my degree, my MFA at Ohio State, and get my entree into Hollywood, which Grafton has always mentioned, so I won't go into detail. But working at Boss Film on uh, Species, this is actually funny. The, the day I, I came to Boss Film Studios, they were still doing practical effects. So they were doing digital, but they also had um, physical models and uh, on Species, there was a scene where there were these two aliens in a water tank. They had people dressed in wetsuits with hoses in a water tank uh, having sex, because this was an a alien wet dream sequence. And I'm walking into Voss Film my first day, and I see these two people in alien suits, like, ah, 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 ah. And I was like, man, my parents would be so proud of me right now. <laughs> I've, I've made it, right? Water splashing everywhere. Um, but uh, I moved on to more wholesome fare at the uh, Walt Disney Studios on Fantasia, Dinosaur, etc. cetera, uh, Chicken Little, as, as uh, Grafton mentioned. And then my own work, I, you know, scratching that itch to continue to do my own creative work with short films like Henry's Garden. This would not have been possible if I had not continued to supplement and educate myself in different ways to meet the new challenges uh, the, the digital industry was booming, right? Things were turning on their head in Hollywood, as many people here know, in terms of uh, some people losing their jobs and some people acquiring jobs, but it really was predicated upon whether you were staying fleet of foot in terms of what you were learning and how you were growing. Um, I'm not a member of the Avengers and I'm not an anarchist. The A stands for Animation Options. That was my consulting company uh, about 10 years ago. Um, I have this slide up because it represents the continued education and the continued insertion into that talent stack that I had to do for producing, for consulting, uh, for learning legal terms so I can deal with a contract and, and not be a lawyer, but at least understand what the lawyers were talking about. Um, improv, that, that's me with my butt in the air on stage, um, uh, to be comfortable uh, speaking and to be comfortable dealing with unpredictable situations. So all of this stuff adding to my stack, and then I come back to Cleveland one year for a visit, and I catch up with this guy, Julian Stancic. And uh, Julian was uh, one of my painting mentors, kind of sort of like the painting mentor, and a, a sweet, sensitive, terrifying man who, uh, if any of you know him, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I remember one day Julian came into my studio and he looked at one of my paintings and he just stared at it and stared at it. And then he said, that one, he said, not bad. And then I, I had to push my luck. Right? I said, hey, Mr. Sansic, how about, how about this one over here? And he looked at it and he said, poop. And then he walked out of my studio. <laughs> so I, I learned, uh, don't, don't press your luck. Take the win and, and just stop there. Um, but I mentioned that story because I was terrified of his opinion of what I was doing. Like I was the sellout who had abdicated the fine arts and was in Hollywood and, and just like this, this crass representation of everything that Julian probably, I thought, hated. And I was chatting with him and he's asking me what I was doing. And he had this silly smile on his face. And I thought to myself, um, you know, I was kind of shocked. And he said, I'm so happy for you and I'm so proud of you. And I was just stunned. And he said, Kevin, he said, when you talk about what you're doing, he said, I see your passion, right? I see how happy you are. And he said, this makes me so happy, he said of himself. To see that light in your eyes, he said, you've, you've found what fits you, what suits you. You're, you're on the right path. 
And I was kind of blown away by that. But that, again, made an impression on me because I realized that Julian didn't want me to be any one particular thing except myself. And that's really something that all of you should take away is that you only have to be yourself and you only should be yourself. And that, that self will constantly be evolving and changing, but you have at any moment to look at your, your own self to be true to who you are and who you want to be, not what anybody else wants you to be or thinks you should be, or what you think other people think you should be. So the second point related to all this, take calculated risks. You notice this person appears to be trained, they're focusing on where they're landing, they've got equipment, right? They're not just jumping off a building. <laughs> it's a calculated risk. It's a dangerous occupation that they're engaged in, but in a calculated way. Um, for me, going to China, I guess this wasn't even a calculated risk. This was like jumping off a building. When I went to China, I just kind of went uh, without any real conception of, of uh, what that was going to be like or what I was going to do. But I very quickly found myself in a situation where that talent stack really came in handy, especially the improv, being able to think on your feet, adjust to rapidly evolving situations, meeting different people. You see there's different faculty and politicians and, and uh, producers behind me who I would have to deal with as we were trying to create content in China. And when I went over, I didn't go over as a Disney guy. I went over on my own independently to do my own films. And this led to a certain amount of notoriety within China in the press as this crazy foreigner who's trying to you know, make films in China and talk about quality and intellectual property. What is that? Um, and, and really get some traction with the Chinese market in terms of uh, something that's Chinese, uh, done, uh, facilitated by a foreigner, but of international uh, uh, quality. Magic Dumpling Entertainment was a company that I founded with my colleagues to really sort of uh, get this rolling. And this led to our opportunity to go to Disney, for me the second time, for them the first, in China, developing local content for the Chinese market. So we were building a team from scratch, educating them in the properties, the principles rather, of uh, the creative process, the Disney process, but adapting it to China. We weren't just trying to shoehorn Western principles into the Asian market, but to adapt them flexibly to what audiences and also uh, the uh, um, officials were uh, looking for and would allow. And the culmination of this, the culmination of the talent stack, the calculated risks for me was being able to take, uh, it's called banjing baliang in, in Chinese, uh, which translates to the pot calling the kettle black. Uh, Chip and Nick are their English names. These, this Stone Lion buddy comedy that premiered on CCTV. It was Disney's first TV co-production ever, which was cool. A lot of work, a lot of hell to get that out. As any of you know who have made any kind of work, painting to a, a film, it's not easy. But it was really rewarding to see this finally come about. And none of this was planned. I didn't leave CIA in 1989 thinking, oh, well, I'm going to think laterally, and I'm going to cultivate my talent stack, and then I'm going to take a calculated risk, and that should result in this. But by going down that path, by going down and pursuing this process, one thing led to another. And in an adaptive fashion, I was able to capitalize on that. There were many things that didn't work, but the things that did led to situations and to opportunities that I found very rewarding uh, and that were rewarding for other people who I worked with. So then wrapping this up, um, life will throw unexpected curves at you. Um, the unexpected curve for me was having a, a child at age 50, uh, which is something I never thought would happen, and then really needing to change my game at that point because I wanted to spend more time with my family, uh, my wife, my, my child. Um, this led me to make another lateral move away from Disney into immersive media, which sounds counterintuitive, but it was a way for me to continue to work. My, my daughter looks thrilled though, right? She <laughs> was a way to work from home, to work independently, to spend time with the family, but also to really engage myself in something that I saw coming up, which was the third wave of VR. Uh, when I was in graduate school in the 90s, I was privy to the second wave, which didn't work out, uh, but I did some dabbling in that. The first wave was back in the 60s, uh, some of you may know, and this third wave, hopefully will actually have some traction in terms of people like yourselves finding entertainment uh, opportunities, not only creative, but also in terms of consumption that will lead to uh, a fruitful market. But um, I embraced this whole hog and re-educated myself essentially in immersive media, um, started speaking on the topic, 
my second daughter was born, because why not? Um, <laughs> and when that happened, I really started to get serious about doing something for the kids. You know, they, they don't care so much about the technology, but I've got these kids, I'm watching them grow. How can I do something that really leverages on the learning process I'm having as a father, a late life father with these children, and then turn that into some content that can be appreciated by them and by others? And that's what led me to Pee Wee Frog, uh, to publish, create, publish my own children's books, primarily for my own children, uh, but, but ultimately for you know, children around the world. My third and last point, creativity is currency. Everything is not about money, but of course money and resources are important, so I just want to address this. This slide is intentionally blank. As artists, you guys are ahead of the game. You may think, and many people think, oh, art school, that's where you just kind of fool around and do whatever you like, and then you get out, and then the real world hits you, right? Well, no. Our world is full of uncertainty. Even jobs that people think are secure, I'm gonna go get a real job, a secure job, nothing is secure anymore, you guys know this. People get laid off, even when people are in a job that they like and they don't get laid off, the turnover from their own desire to move on is, is more rapid and iterative than ever before, right? Life is uncertain, the path is uncertain. You guys wrestle with uncertainty every single day. The blank canvas, the ball of clay, the empty computer screen, and you fill that empty space with your ideas, your concepts, your thoughts. You generate something from nothing, and you do this all the time. And it's a gut-wrenching experience. You don't know how things are gonna turn out. 90% of the time, stuff doesn't turn out, right? But 10% of the time, you get something that's worthwhile, and maybe 1% of the time, you, you strike gold. And you know you're a generator. You're not reliant on other people for opportunities. You're gonna be creating opportunities. And this comes from your education here at the school your creative education, the eye that you have, the brain that you have. So I want to encourage you all, don't chase money, don't be this hamster in a wheel, but let money chase you. Pursue your passion, pursue what you love, just like Julian taught me, like the other teachers here taught me, when you pursue what you love, the opportunities follow. The satisfaction, at the very least, follows, right? The, the sense that you're doing something that is right for you and that is rewarding uh, for yourself. So in closing, uh, I want to, uh, has anybody here um, received all oh, the places you'll go as a graduation gift? Yes, okay, cool. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, Dr. Seuss, there's a, a page here that has some parting words for you that I'd like to share. You have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know, and you are the one who will decide where to go. You are the one who will decide where to go. So think laterally, follow your passion, and the sky is the limit. Thank you very much.